This is the second hour of physics 1b for November 11th. Um, now we're going to be talking about uh, some relationships and things associated with the heat capacities of ideal gases. And we've mentioned before and talked about heat capacity. We've talked about specific heat. They're slightly different from each other. November 1st, why are you asking that question? Sorry, did I confuse you? Is today not November 1st? November 11th? I don't, I don't know, man. Can't imagine why it would matter. All right, heat capacity is an ideal gas. Uh, so uh, we've talked in the past about um, the heat capacity of an ideal gas, and we said that there's this thing called molar specific heat at constant volume, and we used this equation. Just to remind you what's in this equation, little n is number of moles, dq is heat, cv is, so I'll write what that is right here. So c sub v is the molar heat capacity for a constant volume process. This would be a process in which the volume doesn't change. Um, shown over here are two different processes. The constant volume one is right here. So it says measuring molar heat capacity of ideal gas. A is constant volume. The idea is you add heat. The container itself has a fixed volume, so it can't, uh, can't increase in size. Uh, and we know then the heat added has to directly go into changing the temperature of the system. So the temperature increases from some T to some T plus DT. So heat goes in, temperature increases, okay? And we can measure the relationship between the amount of heat we add to the amount of temperature change that we get, and we should come up with a, um, a constant that's called the molar heat capacity at constant volume. Um, there's other possible, possible things you can do here too as well. So the other picture here, you've got constant pressure. So this would be if you have some kind of piston that's able to move so a container with a movable piston, um, and the movable piston is gonna make it so that you have constant pressure. So now what's gonna happen is that you add heat, the temperature changes, but now the volume has to increase if you want the pressure to make to, to, to stay the same. Does that seem reasonable? If you wanna add heat, the temperature is gonna change. Um, in order for the pressure to be constant, would you all agree that the volume is gonna to have to increase? So given that that's the case, and of course you can think about that in terms of the ideal gas law equation, which says that pressure is equal to N times R times T divided by volume. So it is possible that pressure is constant while temperature increases as long as the volume is also increasing. Because if temperature and volume increase, then the ratio can stay the same and the pressure can remain constant. Okay, so we define Cp to be the molar heat capacity at constant pressure. And so it turns out to be the case that the way in which a gas can actually absorb heat is different depending on whether the volume is increasing or whether the temperature is increasing. And that's what these things state is that you get different values. And one is always larger than the other one, as you can see from this table right here. Oh, and I should also mention, here's the equation. Um, looks exactly the same. You just replace the, the CV with a CT, with a CP. Okay, so we have these two equations here. And now when we go to this table, we actually look at what the values are. I'll make this bigger so you can actually see them. We have CV written over here. We have CP written right here. Which is bigger, CP or CV? In all cases, CP is bigger, right? There's not a single case, right? Okay, so that seems to imply, it seems to imply that um, a gas at constant pressure 
seems to be able to, or it takes more heat. Yeah, it takes more heat to increase the temperature in the constant pressure case, right? Does that make sense? Because if we, if we re, re, rewrite this equation here, we we'll write it as dq divided by cp is equal to ndt. So change in temperature and change in or the amount of heat that comes in and the change in temperature associated with it is there's a direct relationship, right? You put heat in, you get a temperature change, right? But if CP is bigger than CV, right? If you compare these two things, DQ over CV equal to NDT. So let's say that I give the same gas. Let's let's talk about just one of the gases here. Let's talk about helium gas. So say that I put 100 joules of heat into helium gas, and we think about what happens for a constant volume process and a constant pressure process. In which case will the temperature change be the biggest? So I'll repeat it. We add 100 joules of heat to helium. Okay, that's our DQ. And we do one as a constant volume process, one as a constant pressure process. Which is gonna, which one is gonna end up with a higher final temperature? Which one is gonna have the bigger DT? The constant volume process, right? Because it's a smaller number, yeah. So exactly, 100 over 12 is greater than 100 over 20, exactly. So it seems to be the case that if you're talking about a constant pressure situation, that you seem to have to add more energy, right? More heat in order to get the same temperature change. And probably why that's the case is that when you add heat in and the volume changes, your gas is now doing work on its environment, right? So I think it's pretty reasonable to think that some of the energy you're adding here is also going to moving the piston, which is why I think why CP is bigger than CB. We're going to go through a whole derivation here in a second, but just want to kind of make sure everyone's on board. Um, the other thing you'll notice from this table right here is they have this other column right here where they've basically taken CP minus CV. And as long as you just kind of don't look at the polyatomic ones, you just look down to here. So, so kind of ignore these for a second. If we look at monatomic and diatomic, the CP minus v CV is equal to 8.31 which is exactly equal to what? What is that 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin? It's the gas constant R, right? So it turns out to be the case that the difference between these two is exactly equal to the gas constant R, which is really quite fascinating. And we're going to try to, uh, we're gonna try to prove that, okay? So basically we wanna prove that CP minus CV is equal to R. That's our goal. That is our goal. So we'll go through this proof. All right. So um, first we're gonna talk about a constant volume process. This is our goal. Prove that CP, we're gonna need a lot of room for this thing. So let's go down and wait on here. Not a lot of room. Okay, so for a constant volume process, We know that uh, there's a relationship between DQ, number of moles, specific heat at constant volume, and the change in temperature. Okay, so we have infinitesimal amount of heat that flows in. Its temperature increases by an infinitesimal amount. All right. Um, now we know that in this process, so constant volume. Let's just draw a picture right here, so we know what's going on. Here's our constant volume container and we've got gas molecules inside of here, right? We send heat inside of it, DQ. Volume can't possibly change. As a result, the temperature increases from T to T plus DT. So we get a change in temperature, right? Remember, um, we're not doing any calculus right now, right? So if these Ds confuse you, everywhere there's a D, you could replace it with a delta. Okay, just, just think of the D as being a delta if it confuses you. It just means a change or a small amount. Right. Okay, so constant volume process, heat comes in, temperature changes like this, but we also know what happens to the pressure now. Is the pressure going to go up or is the pressure going to go down? What 
What happens to the pressure inside this gas? So constant volume means the container's fixed. Yeah, the pressure has to go up, right? Because we're adding energy into the system, it's a fixed volume. The temperature increases, which means the molecules are vibrating more quickly, which means they're going to be making more collisions per second with the wall and stuff like that. So the pressure has to go up, okay? Pressure goes up, but the volume doesn't change, right? So it's a constant volume process, which means we know that the work done by the gas has to be equal to what? Zero, right? Because again, this is equal to the integral PDV, even though the pressure is increasing, DV is the same. Again, that's like doing an integral with the limits being the same in both cases. We know the work is equal to zero, okay? We'll call it DW because we're going to be going back to using, uh, we're talking about these DQs and DWs and stuff like that. So what does that mean? Well, we know from our, um, what is it called? The first law of thermodynamics, the DU, the change in internal energy of the system, right, is equal to uh, DQ, heat that flows in, minus DW. But this is zero, so we know that the increase in internal energy of the system is equal to DQ. Okay, well that means that the increase in internal energy now is equal to this, so it's equal to NCV dt, right? So this is our constant volume process. We've now come up with an expression for du. Okay, just to remind you of where this is all going. Our goal is to relate CP and CV to each other. So we now have a relationship about the change in internal energy and how it relates to um, the change in temperature and the quantity called specific heat at constant volume, right? So now let's talk about a constant pressure process. Okay, so in the constant pressure process, what happened was we had a system. This system now has a movable um, piston. Okay, can move up and down. Maybe I'll draw two pictures for this one. Um, we've got our gas molecules in here. We add heat. Heat goes in. As a result of that, our piston's going to move up to some new position. So the piston moves. And we get a little change in volume right here. The gas expands up into this region here. And we also get a temperature change. So again, the temperature goes to T plus DT. So the internal energy is going to increase. The volume is going to increase. So we know volume is increasing here. But pressure is constant, OK? So the piston moves up just so to make it so that the, uh, the pressure remains constant. And uh, what we know in this kind of case is that our DQ is going to be, um, OK, so now for a constant pressure process, DQ is going to be equal to in CPDT, OK? And now the work done, DW, there's actually going to be some work done now because the gas does work on its environment. Okay, so work is done here on the environment. And that amount of work is going to be equal to whatever the constant pressure that we're using is times the change in volume. And I guess I could put in here that the change in volume would be this right here, basically. Okay, you go from the initial volume, you add that dV, so you, you get an increase in volume. Okay, so then we can say that we know that du is equal to dq minus dw, right? And we can rearrange this if we want to, to be dw is equal to dq minus du to get the things that we know on the same side. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Sorry, we already have everything here. Okay, so second, uh, first law of thermodynamics says that du is equal to dq minus dw. We can now plug in dq and dw into this equation here. Um, but actually, before we do that, one thing that we could do is we could say that we know that um, from the ideal gas law, so let's write that down right here. The ideal gas law says that PV is equal to nRT, right? 
And if we have a constant pressure process in which the volume changes by an amount dV, then we can say that uh, if that volume change is associated with a temperature change that we call dT, we can basically replace dW with just this. So if we take that and we plug it in right here for dW, and we take this and we plug it in for dQ, then we're going to get this equation. So we'll have du is equal to dq is n cp dt minus dw. We're going to put this in here, n times r times dt. OK. Now, one of the things that we said earlier, I'll stop for a second. Is everyone on board with where this came from? Just going back through it again, constant pressure process in which we add some energy dq to a system, and we know that that energy we add is related to this equation, n times cp dt. This is effectively just the specific heat equation, but instead of using specific heat per unit gram, we use specific heat that's per unit mole. All right? So we have the energy that goes in directly related to the temperature increase. Right? How is it related? Well, it depends on the number of moles of the substance and what its specific heat is. Nothing new. Remember, this equation, in case it's accusing, confusing you, is no different from this equation. These equations are equivalent to each other. They just use different units. Normally, C in the MCAT equation is in uh, joules per kilogram degree Celsius. CP is joules per mole degree Celsius. Okay? It's just, changing, it's just exchanging mass for moles. That's all we've done. Okay? So that, 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 that equation tells us we add energy, we get... This, this is how the temperature is going to change. Energy goes in, temperature changes, right? Put, put that into our uh, first law. It shows up right here. Also, we say work done on the environment is PDV, but we say that PDV we can be written as NRDT, and then we get this expression right here. Everyone on board? It makes sense to, as to how we got where we are? I'm slowing down because I think the next step is... Uh, My chat scrolled up by. You're right, it is, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah, it seems seems that that thing gets altered a little bit all the time. I appreciate that. Okay, looks like you can see it now. Okay, again, I ask: uh, is 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 everybody lost? If you're lost, then it's probably good. It means that you're you're, you're trying to pay attention, but it's it's all very confusing because all you're seeing is a bunch of symbols and stuff. I remember feeling that way when I was in all of my grad school classes and you'd go through an entire class and all the professor would do would write symbols on the board and that's what we're doing today. And uh, I apologize for it, but that's just what we do sometimes. We just do derivations. <laughs> okay, so again, our goal was to be, can we prove that CP minus CV is equal to R? We're about to do it, right? Hey, I'm not going fast, Troy. No, this is not fast. I could go way faster than this. I'm stopping and asking questions. I'm repeating myself over and over again. I'm not going fast. Please don't say that I'm going fast. I kind of find that to be a little bit rude when I'm going as slowly as I can. I know I talk quickly. I know I talk quickly. But trust me that we are going slow. This is slow. Me stopping and asking questions is slow. Fast is just constantly writing equations and never stopping. That's fast. You understand? All right. So it seems like everybody's on board. Even if you're not, it's fine. You don't have to understand every derivation. We're just trying to get through this stuff. Okay, now here's the next part. And this, this part I found really confusing when I first taught this class. I think I understand it better now. So we have this expression for du from our constant volume process, right? We've got this expression for du from our constant pressure process. And now the next step is to say that because we know that for an ideal gas, the change in internal energy is only related to its change in temperature, then no matter how you go between those two points, Okay, um, no matter how you go from from one temperature to the other temperature, from say point A to point B, um, it doesn't matter if you go along a constant volume process or you go along a constant pressure process. As long as you're going from A to B and the temperature changes dT in both cases, then the internal energy change should be the same as well. So we should be able to equate this du and this du right here. They should be the same. 
we're talking about ideal gases in particular, and for ideal gases, du is related directly to the temperature. So we should be able to take this and put it on the left-hand side of this equation here, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to say that du is also cv times dt. This is equal to n cp dt, and you'll start to notice that every term has the same n dt in it, right? n dt, n dt, n dt, right? So all of those cancel, and we're just left with cv is equal to cp minus r, or that cv plus r is equal to cp, which I prefer because I like equations that don't have minus signs in them whenever we can avoid it. Okay. Does the result make sense? We're going to use this result a lot. Um, so just, uh, if you didn't understand the derivation, that's okay. Hopefully you can understand this. And just to pull this down here, CV and CP, CP minus CV seems to be equal to R, which is the same thing as saying that CV plus R is equal to CP. All right, any questions? Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to um, look at the ratio of the heat capacities. which we're going to call gamma. And gamma is going to be the ratio, I think it's the big one over the small one, right? CP over CV, yeah. Gamma is CP divided by CV. Now, uh, if we're talking about ideal gases, this is going to take on a very specific value. So for ideal gases, we can say that, so, so this is the statement for ideal gases right here, CV plus R is equal to CP. So we can say that uh, gamma would be equal to CV plus R divided by CV, or that gamma is equal to one plus R divided by CV. And um, if we look at the values of CV, how do we do this next step? I've lost myself. Yeah, that's what we did. Early on, we made this statement that CV was equal to, is it three fifths? Three halves R. We made this statement earlier on. This is a couple weeks ago or last week, can't remember, that, that the specific heat at constant volume is equal to three halves R. We got this by using the relationship that um, one half mv squared average was equal to three halves kt. And then we basically compared this to the ideal gas law and the specific heat at constant volume equation, and we eventually derived this right here. So if we know that cv is equal to three halves r, then this equation becomes one plus r divided by three over two times r. So this, is, this tells us that the ratio CP over CV, which is equal to what we call gamma, is going to be 1 plus 1 over 3 halves, which is 1 plus 2 thirds, which would be 1.67 approximately. Like that. So this is monatomic gases, right? This is ideal gases monatomic. Because for monatomic ideal gases, we got this. This is also a monatomic ideal gas statement. For diatomic ideal gases, I think we had gamma was CV was equal to 5 halves R. Move this down a little bit. Um, for diatomic gases, CV was equal to five halves R, which means that gamma would be equal to one plus one over five halves, which is equal to 1.4. Okay. Okay, 
So we've talked about what CP and CB are. We've come up with this relationship for this thing called gamma. We're going to see this, this ratio gamma show up uh, quite a bit in the next section, but we're going to do a problem first. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Um, another equation, I'm just going to box in all the equations that are going to be valuable to you. You're going to want to remember this one. You're going to want to remember this one. Um, yeah, all the others are whatever. These two, we're going to need to notice all some of these problems. All right. Here, let's move out. We'll pull this over here. I don't know if we'll have time for that one today. We probably will, though. Okay, so we're going to do this problem here. Cooling your room. Okay, it says a typical dorm room or bedroom contains about 2,500 moles of air. Find the change in internal energy of this much air when it is cooled from 35 degrees Celsius to 26 degrees Celsius at a constant pressure of one atmosphere. Treat the air as an ideal gas of gamma equal to 1.4. Okay, so let's write down our equations. We had gamma was equal to Cp over Cv. We had um, uh, dq was equal to n, and then you have either Cv or Cp here, dt. We've got our other one, dq is equal to ncp dt. Um, and then, what's the other one? Um, cp is equal to cv plus r. And that equation. All right, so we have a typical dorm room or bedroom contains n equal to 2500 moles of air. Find the change in internal energy of this much air when it is cooled from, so it's cooled from an initial temperature of 35 degrees Celsius to a final temperature of 26 degrees Celsius at a constant pressure of one atmosphere. So we know it's a constant pressure system, which means we can use this equation. And we're going to treat the air as an ideal gas with gamma equal to 1.4. Zero, zero. Okay. So what are we finding? Change in internal energy, right? Oh, so that actually means we need this equation. du is equal to dq plus dw, which was in cv dt plus n r dt. That was one of the equations we used in our derivation, right? This one right here, right here. So constant pressure process, du is equal to this, which we wrote down right here. Oh, no, not cv. This is cp. cp. And I think we have... Oh, no, no, no. It's subtracted. You're right. I'm sorry. Thank you. It's subtracted. That should give us the change in internal energy. Now we have discrete values, so we can change this to delta U is equal to N CP delta T minus NR delta T. And we can kind of factor some things out here because N delta T shows up twice. So we have N delta T on the outside multiplied by CP minus R. I'm pretty sure CP minus R is equal to CV. I don't know which one we want to use. Well, it doesn't really matter. I well, we, Here's what we want to do in this problem. We want to solve this without using the table. We want to use this. So, are we going to use this equation? I've lost myself. Yeah, because you can solve this equation here. 
let's copy this one down as well. We can solve this equation for CV, right? So CP minus R from our equation here is equal to CV. So this becomes N CV delta T. And from this equation, let's see, gamma minus one is equal to R over CV, which means that CV is equal to R divided by gamma minus one. So we can plug that in here. So we'll get N R delta T divided by gamma minus one. And I think we have everything we need to solve that one then. Anyone have any questions? So gamma was 1.4. Can you all calculate that and tell me what you get? Negative four, six, seven thousand. Okay, that seems reasonable. Twenty six minus thirty five is negative eleven. Is twenty six minus thirty five actually negative nine? Is that what's going on there? It probably is. Oops. Yeah, four six seven thousand. So the Gas has lost 467,000. So change in internal energy is negative 467. We'll just say 000 zero, zero, zero joules. Okay. Anyone have any questions? So if not, we're going to talk specifically about an adiabatic process for an ideal gas. This is another, what I consider to be pretty confusing derivation, but we'll get through it. All right, so I just want to scroll down, but it won't let me. Maybe if I write something here, it will. There we go. Okay. Okay, adiabatic process. What does that mean? Adiabatic. Can you all remind me really quickly, what was an adiabatic process? Yep, no heat transfer. That's right. No heat enters the system in or out, exactly. That's right. An adiabatic process for an ideal gas, again, this means that dq is equal to zero. No heat comes in and no heat goes out. All right. Um, do I want to put this picture in here? I don't think it matters. I mean, we can draw this picture. So the book has this uh, plot where they're plotting pressure versus volume, probably, right? Yeah, it's always pressure versus volume. And on this, they have two different graphs. So they've got um, one for a temperature T that looks like this. Why does it look like this? It looks like that because if you if you use the ideal gas law, you get that nRT divided by V is, so you should get a, an equation that looks something like this. So this is the temperature T, and then they have another curve that's above it, which is gonna be for a temperature that's gonna be T plus DT. And they just talk about a process um, where you go from here to here. 
So from point A to point B, so this is the path that you take in the PV space. And we're going to be looking at the pressure here. This is going to be the initial pressure and final pressure. We'll call it P1 and P2 or something. Oh, we call it PB. That makes sense. PB and PA. And then if we drop a line down like this, a line down like this, this is going to be VA and VB. Okay. So this is going to be an adiabatic process in which um, temperature can change, volume can change, pressure can change, but somehow the uh, there's no heat flow uh, into or out of the system, okay? All right. Um, in this case, this is going to be a compression. It says the air in the input hose, output hose of air compressors used to inflate tires and to fill scuba tanks is always warmer than the air entering the compressor. Hmm, does that sound right to you all? That the air output of hoses from air compressors used to inflate tires or to fill scuba tanks is always warmer than the air entering the compressor. Does that sound right to you all? Thinking about like when you when you fill up a when you inflate your tires, it doesn't sound right. Okay, well, if you have no experience with it, I guess we just move on. Okay, so our goal here is we want to relate uh, pressure, volume, and temperature in this adiabatic process, okay? So our goal is to come up with an equation that uh, relates uh, pressure, volume, and temperature for an ideal gas in, uh, in this process, okay? Uh, and also to relate that to things like work and change in energy and all the other stuff that we've talked about before. Okay, so we know that uh, since we're talking about ideal gas where dq is equal to zero, and normally our equation is that dq is equal to, no, 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 it's du, right? du is normally equal to dq plus dw, no, minus dw, because the work leaves the system. If dq is zero, then what we have is that du is going to be equal to negative dw. Uh, I think we know what dw is, right? So dw is going to be... Okay, you all tell me, what am I going to write down here next for DW? What's the work done always going to be for this adiabatic process? PDV, yep. Now, since it's DW, so we always say, uh, let's write it down here somewhere. DW is PDV, but W is integral PDV, just so you know the distinction. When we just write the infinitesimal, we just write it like this. Okay, so dW then is going to be pressure dV. And du, we found the easiest way to write du is just to write it as n times cv dt. Because even if we're not talking about a constant volume process, this isn't a constant volume process, um, the, the temperature change is still going to be associated with the same amount of internal energy change. We kind of saw that happen in the last problem. I don't know if you noticed this. In the last problem we did... We started off with this long expression, but then we eventually got to the fact that the change in energy is actually just equal to this. Even though this was a constant uh, pressure process, right? The we, we actually ended up using the constant volume thing because it's just an easier way to find change in energy because for an ideal gas, they're the same. So here, same thing. Even though this isn't a constant volume process, the volume is definitely changing. Uh, we can still use this as a way to, to equate it. All right, next thing we can do is we can replace the pressure with this expression here. So let's do that. We'll use the ideal gas law and say NCV dt is now equal to NRT divided by V dV. All right. And then we can rearrange. Our goal now is to... I think we've done this once before. Let's start off by getting everything on the same side of the equation. Oh, I dropped a minus sign right here. Oops, there we go. Um, what I want to do now is I want to make sure that I get all of the temperatures together and all the volumes together. So I have dV right here and V. I have dt right here, but I have t right here. So what I want to do is I want to divide through the entire equation by t. 
So we'll go and do it like that. And then I'm just going to erase the T from here. All right. You should be able to see how to go from this line to this line. Divide by T and then rearrange. And now we can also say that uh, what do we do next? Divide through by CV. Oh, the ends cancel. There's an in here and there's an in here. We're going to get the CV onto this one here. So we're going to have DT over T plus R over CV DV over V. R over CV is, if we go back to here, R over CV is equal to gamma minus 1. See that from this equation right here? R divided by CV is gamma minus 1. I'll write this over here on the left. So we can replace that in this equation so that this becomes... Are we going to do the integral now? Yeah. So now we integrate both sides of this equation. I'm going to stop for a second because I went through a lot of steps right there. Any questions? So adiabatic process where the change in, in cha the the heat coming into the system is zero. Heat flowing out of the system is zero. We look at a PV diagram where we have two different what are called isotherms. One temperature here, one temperature plus dt here. The uh, object goes from temperature A to temperature. It goes from point A to point B. All right, and uh, that's at a pressure A at point A, a pressure B at point B, a volume A. And in this process. Um, it does some work on its environment. We could find the work if we wanted to by finding the volume, the area of this. If pressure isn't constant from A to B, how are we able to use PV for work? Uh, I didn't use PV, we use PDV. So I don't, yeah, pressure is definitely not constant, right? Not constant for sure. And thank, I'm sorry, someone's at the door. Yeah, I can see how that's confusing. So um, just to kind of clarify, um, you can see here that the pressure is a function of volume, right? So since the pressure is a function of volume, yeah, and when it says PDV, so this, this pressure here is allowed to change as the volume changes as well. P is a variable in this equation. It's a variable that's related to volume, which we then are, are now going to kind of integrate away. Okay, so next step, we have dt over t. All right, so... As I was saying, adiabatic process, we get through here, we replace the energy coming in with, uh, with this, we replace the work done with this, we do some rearrangements, we make the replacement of R over CV as gamma minus one, and now we can integrate. And we're gonna integrate from, uh, let's just use one and two. All right, well, we can use A and B, right? So we're gonna integrate from VA to VB Things your book uses one and two, but I think that's fine. And, oh no, your book doesn't actually use, oh, I see what they do. They're gonna do something kind of different. You know what, I don't care what the book does. We're gonna use our own symbols. We'll figure out what they're doing in a second. So we go from VA to VB. We go from the temperature at A to the temperature at B. So this ends up getting on the left-hand side, well, I'll just ask you, what do you get when you do this integral? The integral of dt over t. Natural log, yep. Natural log of t b over t a. Um, plus, we're going to get gamma minus 1 
multiplied by the natural log of VB over VA. All right. Now, there's another way you could write this as well, which is, we can write it like this, the natural log of TB plus gamma minus one natural log of VB is equal to the natural log of TA plus gamma minus one natural log of VA, VA, like that. How are we doing on time? Doing pretty good. Which means that this expression of log of T plus gamma minus one log of V is a constant, right? Stop for a second to make sure that's obvious. If I know that the log of the temperature at point B plus gamma minus one times the log of the volume at point B is equal to the log of the temperature at point A plus gamma minus one times the log at, of the volume at point A, that means that as long as I take a temperature and a volume that are at the same point, that this quantity is constant. And moreover, we can rearrange this because if I have gamma minus one multiplied by the log of V, we can rewrite that as the natural log of V to the gamma minus one. And then we can use the other rule of logs, so this is constant. We can use the rule of logs that allows us to, add, if I have logs that are added together, then I can take the, I can multiply the things inside. So we end up getting the natural log of temperature times volume to the gamma minus one. This is constant. Okay. Which means that we can write expressions like this. Um, well, okay, so if the log of this is constant, right, that also means that the thing inside of this is constant, right? So TV to the gamma minus one is a constant. Which means we can write things like this. So I can say that T1 V1 to the gamma minus one should be equal to T2 V2. To the gamma minus one. This reminds me of a question that Troy had asked, actually. Someone earlier asked. Yeah, Troy had asked, can we use PV over T1 is equal to PV over T2 for isothermal? Okay, so it's not exactly the same question, but uh, this is giving us this kind of relationship that we can that we can uh, that we can write down between the temperature and the volume for an ideal gas, okay? So again, this is only gonna work, I'm gonna highlight this because I feel like we're gonna be using this one in the future. So this is again, adiabatic processes. For ideal gases. Okay, so we end up going farther now. So now what we can do is we can also take this equation here and we can replace the temperature because we know that PV is equal to NRT which means that temperature is equal to PV divided by N times R. So another way to write this expression is PV over NR times V to the gamma minus one is a constant. But what am I gonna get if I do V times V to the gamma minus one? What's that equal to? What's that equal to? V to the gamma, right? Because this is like V to the one and you add the powers, right? So we end up getting now pressure times volume to the gamma over NR, but N, wait, is N a constant? 
Your book is saying n is a constant. Why is n constant in this case? It's adiabatic process. Maybe one of the assumptions we made early on was that the, the number of moles wasn't going to change. I guess implicitly we've canceled out the moles along the way. Is that why we can say it's constant? Hmm. Well, I guess one of the things we're going to be assuming is that n is constant. So we'll just I'm just going to say off to the right here, let the number of moles be constant. In that case, we can take the n and the r and absorb them into whatever this constant is. It doesn't matter what it is. The point is that now we get that p to p times v to the gamma is a constant, almost kind of simpler, but similar to this equation right here. All right, um, which again, similar to the way we wrote it here, this means that I can take p1 v1 to the gamma, it should be equal to p2 v2 to the gamma for whatever process we're talking about. Okay, I can see why n is constant now, because we're always going to be talking about two different states um, for the same gas, okay? We can also now calculate the work done by the ideal gas, because we knew that uh, um, q is equal to zero, and the work done is going to be equal to negative times the negative of the change of potential energy, um, not change, sorry, change in internal energy, and we know that um, the change in internal energy from before was equal to N times specific heat at constant volume multiplied by change in temperature, which would be kind of like a T2 minus a T1 kind of thing. So now uh, we can make a replacement here by, um, by saying that, by, by connecting this and this, right? So now the work that the gas does should be equal to the negative of delta U, so the negative of N times CV T2 minus T1. Or you can rearrange these if you want with a negative sign to say work is equal to N CV T1 minus T2. Your book loves this. They love absorbing um, negative signs. I would prefer to write this equation like this. Work is equal to negative N CV delta T. That's, what I would, that's how I would write it but they love doing stuff like this. So, um, And then what we can do is we can say that um, T1 minus T2, again, using P T equal to, or see, so it's PV equal to NRT, which means T is equal to PV over NR. So plugging that into this equation, we get NCV um, P1 V1 minus P2 V2 divided by N times R. And then we have the N's cancel. We have a CV over R. CV over R is gamma minus one, right? Or maybe it's the other way around. I'll try it like the CV over R times P1 V1 minus P2 V2. And then CV over R is one over gamma minus one, I think. There we go. R over CV is gamma minus one, so the inverse CV over R is gonna be one over gamma minus one. Let's write it over here. CV over R is one divided by gamma minus one. So we have P1 V1 minus P2 V2 divided by gamma minus one is equal to the work done. So what equations do we get out of this? Well, we got the PV to the gamma is a constant. T1 V1 to the gamma minus one is a constant. And this one, pressure one, volume one minus pressure two, volume two over gamma minus one is equal to the work done. Okay. Anyone have any questions before you do a problem? This is the end of chapter 19 here, the final the final end of it. And it's 11.47. We have three minutes to do this problem. It's not that long. Okay. All right, adiabatic compression in a diesel engine. All right, the compression ratio of a diesel engine is 15 to one. 
That is, air in a cylinder is compressed to 1 15th of its initial volume. So here's the initial volume. You have a piston that compresses the gas down to 1 15th of its original volume. If the initial pressure is 1 times 10 to the fifth pascals, okay, so let's write this like this. So we'll call it pressure 1 is. And the initial temperature, T1, is 300 Kelvin. Find the final pressure and temperature after the adiabatic compression. So again, this is adiabatic because we assume that if this occurs quickly, no heat will come in or out of the system. Um, so we know T1 is 300 Kelvin. We want to find final pressure and the temperature after adiabatic compression. We also know that V1, we're just going to call V1. And we know that V2 is equal to whatever V1 is divided by 15. We could make V1 equal to like 15 meters cubed if we wanted to or something like that. Um, and our goal is to find what is T2, right? The final pressure and temperature. So P2 and T2, all right? How much work does the gas do during the compression if the initial volume of the cylinder is one liter? Ah, so they actually do give us a value for this. So this is gonna be one liter and this is going to be one liter divided by 15. All right. Um, it says to use the values of CV equal to 20.8 joules per mole Kelvin and gamma equal to 1.4. All right, so let's go through and try to solve this. So part A, pressure two equals what? Temperature two equals what? All right, so we're gonna have to go back and look at the equations that we have. We want something that's going to relate the initial pressure, temperature, volume to the final pressure, temperature, volume. And we can use any of these that we want. We could probably use, we could probably use this one to begin with, or this one. Because we know P1 and V1, we could use those to find P2, V2. Actually, we, we know pressure, we know one of these, we know volume two, right? Let's start with this equation. This is the easier one to use, I think. So PV to the gamma is a constant. We'll start with that. Scroll, let's keep scrolling back up. All right. So we know that PV to the gamma is a constant. How do we use this equation? What we do is we basically are going to say pressure one, volume one to the gamma should be equal to pressure two, volume two to the gamma. We want to solve for pressure two. So it's going to be P one multiplied by V one over V two to the gamma, both of them to the gamma should be equal to pressure two. So this is going to be pressure one was 1.015 or just 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. We're multiplying this by V one over V two. So V one was just V one, V two is 15 V one. We raise that to the gamma power, which is 1.4. And that'll give us our answer. So I get two, two, seven, nine. Very, very small amount. Huh. Why did the pressure go down so much? I must have done this backwards, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm stupid. I'm stupid. It's 1 over 15. Where's the draw part? V2 is 1 15th the volume. So this should have been V1 over 15. That makes way more sense. That answer didn't make any sense. So if we take this and I just go like this. There we go. 44... Yeah, let's just click on 
this button. 4.4.5 times 10 to the sixth. That makes way more sense. Okay, so this is 4.5 times 10 to the sixth Pascals, which is like 45, so it's like 45 atmospheres of pressure or so. All right, that's P2. And we also wanted to find, what else was there? The temperature. So for the temperature, we can use the other equation, which was, I think it was TV to the gamma minus one is a constant. So we say T1 V1 to the gamma minus one is equal to T2 V2 to the gamma minus one. And we just solve for T2. So we'll get T1 multiplied by V1 over V2 to the gamma minus one is equal to T2. So T1 was 300 Kelvin. V1 over V2 we know is 15 to the gamma minus one is to the 0 0.4 power, should be equal to T2. So we do 300 times 15 to the 0.4. We get eight point, so it's 800, what is that, 88, 886. So we get T2 is equal to 886 Kelvin. We are over by four minutes. Man, these things always take longer than I think. I'm still gonna solve for the last part. For the last part, we wanna use this equation to find how much work does the gas do during the compression if the initial volume of the cylinder is that. Da -da -da -da. So we're gonna use this equation here. Come on, let me, let me click. Let me use my cursor. Come on, oh, there it goes. Nope. Oh, we're just gonna write it down. P, P1 V1 minus P2 V2 over gamma minus one. So we're gonna do P1 V1 minus P. Stop it. P2 V2 over gamma minus one should be equal to work done. This is part B. Plugging in our numbers. At the same time, I'm not gonna actually plug the numbers in. We're just gonna use the numbers we have. So it's P1 V1. So P1 was, uh, one point was like one e five basically, times v one was one liter, which is point zero zero one meters cubed, minus p two v two p two is four point. This is what p two was. V two is point zero zero one divided by fifteen. equals that, divide by gamma minus one, which is 0.4. And so we get that, negative 496 or so joules. We are out of time. Uh, it's negative because the gas is being compressed, so the work done is being done on the gas, right? And of course that work creates an explosion which means in the next cycle of the process, the gas is going to explode and then push the cylinder back out and do positive work. And we'll investigate those later cycles of this, uh, this engine process in the in upcoming chapters. Okay, we need to stop there though. So I hope you'll have a great day. We have an exam, I'll just say real quick, we have an exam on, uh, on Wednesday. I've already told you at the beginning of class what the, what the topics are. Um, you know, read the book, do your homework problems, all that kind of stuff. Good luck on the uh, studying. I'll see you all on Wednesday.